start, eh? Mm -hmm. I can start? Yeah. Okay. Good evening and welcome, everyone. My name is Larry Sperka. I'm the manager of capital of water capital projects for the Lakefront Utility Services, Inc. Thank you for joining us today to learn about the Coburg Drinking Water Systems Master Plan. I would like to introduce the project team members attending tonight's meeting. From Lake Front Utility Services, Inc., Derek Paul, President, CEO, Sean Bullender, Manager of Water Operations, Adam Giddings, Director of Regulations and Finance, Alexis Smith, Communication Coordinator. And from our engineering firm, SEMA Plus, Dan Campbell, Senior Project Manager, Will McRae, PNG, Partner, Senior Director of Municipal Infrastructure, Claire Wallace South, EIT Engineering Interim. I would also like to thank our partners at the Town of Coburg for their input. Glenn McLaughlin, Director of Planning and Development, Lori Wells, PNG, Director of Public Works, Terry Hookstra, Manager of Engineering and Capital Projects, Teresa Bain, Deputy Director of Community Services. The Colbert Water Master Plan assess the existing water system, determines future upgrades and maintenance requirements to ensure water infrastructure and demand requirements are available for the growth of the town of Coburg for the next 25 years. This is Coburg's first water master plan. To speak more about it, I will now turn it over to Dan Campbell from SEMA Plus. Thank you. Great, thanks Larry that introduction. So just, just building on what Larry had said, what uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to provide a snapshot overview of the existing Coburg drinking water system so that everybody has a kind of foundation of what exists today and what we're talking about. And then share an overview of the technical analysis that we've done through the master plan. And that helps to inform the master plan recommendations. And finally, to provide an outline of what the recommendations of the master plan are to support the, the drinking water system moving forward as the, the town continues to grow and the service population continues to grow. So just run through a very quick presentation outline and, and sort of the order of events here this evening. And again, thanks to everybody that's taken the time to join us. So we'll start a little bit talking about the master plan purpose and process. We'll then move into talking about what the existing drinking water system looks like today talk a little bit about water demand, the water demands that we see in the system today and the forecasted water demands based on population growth, and then work through the master plan recommendations. And we'll do that in several categories, looking at water treatment, the pumping and storage of treated water in the system, and finally water distribution and how that water is moved around the system. So um, if you can bear with me and my, my COVID hair for 40, 45 minutes here, um, we'll then have a wrap up period and time for some questions and answers. So the way that will work is at the end, if you would like to ask a question, um, you can go to the Zoom control panel on your computer or your device and click the raise your hand button and uh, Larry or Alexis, one of the Lucy staff will um, take note of that and eventually unmute you and ask you to speak and uh, you can uh, put forward your question to us and we'll, uh, we'll endeavor to get you an answer. Um, as we go through the meeting, if you do have a question, we're, we're going to answer all the questions at the end just for logistical reasons. But if you want to type in a question rather than ask one verbally at the end, you can click the Q&A button. That will submit a question. It'll come through to the Lucy staff and we'll read those questions out at the end and loop back and answer those. So we'll start with those questions first and then we'll move on to sort of raise your hand questions after just so that everybody knows the, the order of operations. So with that, yeah, bear with me for 40 minutes. Um, it's a little heavy on numbers and spots, but we've tried to include lots of pictures to help with, uh, with the understanding of that and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get through things here. So the purpose of the master plan and uh, Larry already spoke to uh, a, a number of these items is first off to sort of take stock, take inventory and provide an overview snapshot of the existing system that, uh, that services the town of Coburg today. And then to look at forecasting the water demand that's associated with the projected residential growth and non-residential growth within the Coburg urban slash municipal boundary. We'll talk 
a little bit more about specifically what that uh, that boundary is in terms of geography and uh, and what the growth forecast is. Building on that, we then uh, work on identifying the system expansion projects that are necessary to service the growth and evaluate the different options for delivering those projects. And last but certainly not least is also to identify the non-growth related capital projects that are required to sustain the system for the existing community in good working order over the next 10 years. So the master plan process has been ongoing since uh, since early 2020 with lots of, of detailed technical work uh, amongst the project team. So that's entailed a series of technical analyses completed through uh, what we call technical memoranda. And there have been five of those that deal with starting off with demand, then moving into water storage and water pumping, ultimately into water treatment, and then finally into distribution system requirements. So those those processes have been complete. As I say, they're, they're fairly technical. They've resulted in a draft summary document of the Coburg Drinking Water System Master Plan, which has been completed in early 2021. And essentially what we're doing here today is talking about that document that will be available on the project website after the presentation for everybody to review. I think that will go live tomorrow morning. Where we sit today is uh, you know, a key step in the community and stakeholder consultation process. After we receive some feedback from the community, we'll then move forward to presenting to Coburg Council with a, a di bit of a digest of the feedback that's been received by, from the community in addition to the technical details of the master plan. And then ultimately we move to a final drinking water master plan. And in the future, Lakefront Utilities Services Inc. Lucy would move towards implementing those projects, some of which might require municipal class environmental assessment studies, which are a more detailed project specific type of study. So this consultation piece and the finalization of the plan will, will be in 2021. And then the future beyond 2021 is where implementation and if necessary, some of these other studies would land in the, uh, in the equation. So that's the overall process. The overall study area is essentially the entire town of Coburg. So this is just a quick snip map from the, the town's official plan. Um, a few key things to note. You will hear quite a bit of discussion in our presentation here today about Coburg East, which is essentially the, the lands to the east of Brook Road and the north of the railway corridor where the official plan and the secondary plan for that area sets out a, a framework for fairly significant population growth there. Um, whereas in the past, we've been seeing fairly significant population growth in the town in the new Amherst community secondary plan area, the Elgin Densmore or Parkview Hills secondary plan area, as well as the Coburg West Business Park where Walmart and Home Depot and a number of the other box type real retailers are located to the, to the west of the hospital. And uh, last but not least, it's uh, just quickly mentioned, there's a small portion of uh, the community in Hamilton Township, so north of Highway 401 beyond the Coburg boundary. Um, a couple of hundred residents that are serviced with water that is supplied up, up Ontario Street uh, to those residents. So there's a, there's a very small service population that's outside the town of Coburg Boundary proper. So with that context, we'll roll into just talking a little bit about what the exist, existing distribution system entails in terms of its components. And we'll work through a series of slides here and get progressively a little bit more detailed. So at the, uh, at the beginning of everything, we have the water treatment system. So that's the, the Coburg water treatment plant, which provides filtration and treatment of the raw water, to make it suitable and safe for consumption and use by the, the various customers that are, are connected to the distribution system. From there, we, we need to store that treated water so that we have water to use during periods of peak demand. And in Coburg, uh, that starts off with what we call pump storage. So storage is in the ground and needs a pump to move it out to the users. So in Coburg, that's a reservoir that's located down at the water treatment plant and uh, is pumped from by the high lift pumps, which are our next, uh, next kind of stop on that system framework. So the high lift pumping facilities are the pumps that take that treated water out of the reservoir. It's just sitting there below ground and they pump it at pressure up into the distribution system to supply users and also to fill the floating storage, which is what we, uh, sort of the generic term we use essentially for the water towers that are out there in the system. 
in the system because not everything is at the same elevation. And as we work our way up in elevation from the lake, uh, we lose water pressure. At various points, we do need to boost the pressure and uh, that's done using booster pumping stations that move water from, we'll talk about this a little bit more, from one pressure zone to another pressure zone from areas of low elevation to high elevation and boost that pressure so it's still suitable for the users. Throughout the town, there's the water distribution system and this is, this is you know, is a range of pipes from um, 150 millimeter six inch pipes all the way up to, to larger 400 millimeter uh, 20 inch pipes that, uh, that move water around the system and move it between the various facilities, whether that's pumping or storage. And then ultimately, uh, we kind of wrap up at the very top end of the system elevation wise with floating storage. So those are the elevated tanks or water towers where when water demand is low, the system is pumping water up into those tanks and filling them. And when water demand is high or we've stopped the pumps because there's almost no demand and it's not enough to warrant pumping, water flows back out of those, those elevated tanks and into the distribution system. And the, the weight of that water at height in the tank is what creates pressure in the distribution system when we don't have any pumps running. So that's things at a very high level nutshell. Um, getting a little bit more specific, if we look at how it lays out schematically, we have our raw water source, which is Lake Ontario. So there's an intake drawing water in from Lake Ontario. There's a permit to take water in place that uh, allows the Coburg Water Treatment Plant to take up to just under 32,000 cubic meters of water per day. The water treatment plant itself consists of a series of, uh, of components. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, um, in a few minutes, but overall that plant is, has a rated capacity and approved design capacity to treat about 36,000 cubic meters of water per day. The treated water, as we said, once it's treated in the treatment plant, it lives in the treated water reservoir. It then flows from there into the high lift pump well and the high lift pumps pump it out into pressure zone one. So pressure zone one is the lower elevation parts of town. Currently has a population of just under 14,000 people and a maximum day demand uh, that's metered in that zone of about 9,800 cubic meters per day. So in pressure zone one, we have all the pressure zone one distribution mains all spread out in a network that connects all the users and also connects the storage facilities. So in zone one, there is the older of the two water towers that's on Victoria Street. So just a little bit to the east of Ontario Street behind the old craft plant um, with a volume of about 1300 cubic meters for storage. Sitting above pressure zone one in elevation is pressure zone two population of just over 7,000 people and a maximum day demand of about 5,500 cubic meters. So all the water that goes into pressure zone two is pumped there from zone one. So when the pumps kick on at the York Street booster pumping station, which is on Division Street just north of the railway at York Street going into the, uh, the Northam Industrial Park, they draw water from zone one and push it at higher pressure into zone two. Zone two similarly has a network of, of water distribution uh, system mains and those mains are connected to and fill or receive water from the Strathy Road elevated tank. So when we're pumping, we're filling this tank generally. When we're not pumping, we're generally using the water in this tank to supply and maintain pressure in zone two and the same thing in zone one. And we'll talk a little bit more this evening and we'll just throw it in here for context now that there are areas of higher elevation still that are, are too high to be serviced with reasonable pressures from zone two. So in the future, a third pressure zone will be necessary. So a little less schematic and, uh, and in a bit of a map view, uh, all the same things. So we have the town of Coburg boundary. So this is our study area that we're talking about, all the water demand that exists today and will come from in the future, this, uh, this whole area. The water treatment plant down by the lake with an intake extending out into the lake. We have in dark blue a trunk water main network of large water mains that move water around to a network of slightly smaller sub trunk water mains which then trickle all down into and feed into a network of local water mains which are the light blue lines. In zone one we have the zone one elevated tank so the old craft plant is here and this is the Victoria Street zone one elevated tank or water tower. The zone boundary is this green line. So everything to the south of the green line is in pressure zone one and everything to the north of the green line is in pressure zone two. 
All the water, as we said, is pumped from the Zone 2 booster pumping station at Ewart Street up through those trunk mains and out into Zone 2. And storage in Zone 2 is provided by the Strathy Road elevated tank uh, that is directly south of the, of the hospital and north of the, the Golden Plow uh, um, long-term care residence. And ultimately in the future, this uh, somewhat irregularly shaped line is where Zone 3 would be, high ground that's in the Coburg East community near Nagel Road. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. We did just want to leave this slide here for anybody that may want to come back in and have a look later. Really what this shows is how the zones work from an elevation perspective and how we get at higher elevation. As we move up in elevation, we get lower pressures in each zone and at low elevations, we get higher pressures. And that's why we have pressure zones so that we can keep the pressures in a range of about 40 to 80 PSI, um, depending on where we're at with the, the tank levels. So water demand and the current service population. Today, we, over the, the last few years, the system has averaged an average day demand. So on a typical day, about 9,000 cubic meters of water per day is put out of the treatment plant and into the system. About 65% of that water, or almost 6,000 cubic meters, is used by residential customers. The balance, 35%, is used by non-residential customers. So um, essentially businesses, industrial, commercial, institutional users like schools, that sort of thing. So that's the split between residential and non-residential water use. In Coburg today, the, uh, the system, including the, the population in Hamilton Township, is servicing just under 21,000 people. And that boils down to a per capita water demand of 282 liters per day per person is kind of a key number for planning and forecasting. If we look on the non-residential side, there's about 285 hectares of non-residential land that's built out and developed with various businesses, commercial industrial operations on them. And on average, those 285 hectares use just under 11 cubic meters of water per hectare per day. So we can convert that number um, into a number in liters per day, and then we can divide it by 282 and what that gives us is an equivalent population. So if we treated all these businesses and non-residential users as if they were people, they would be equivalent to 11,000 people using water. So that gives us a total equivalent service population of about 32,000 people. And that's not really um, that important to understand in detail, but it just gives us a nice metric that we can roll everything up to. And when we, when we take the residential population and the non-residential development and add it all together, that's a, a way of kind of talking about it in one, uh, one simplified number. So while well, average day is what's happening most of the time and it's interesting and important, what's actually the most important number for a water system is what the maximum day demand is because we also have to be able to supply what the users need on the max day, not just on that average typical day. So in Coburg, the maximum day demand typically involves about 1.7 times factor of water usage over the average day. So that gives us a maximum day demand of just over 15,000 cubic meters a day per day today on that max day. So if you look at that, we have our total of 15,000 cubic meters, 9,000 we see on an average day and a little over 6,300 we see added to that on the maximum day of demand in the year. And that's really the number that most of the system has to be designed for to ensure that the system can operate properly under that range of conditions. So looking ahead into the future a little bit to a condition that we call build out, we have our existing population about 21,000 people today, our existing developed land, about 285 hectares, which gives us our 9,000 and then our 15,000 max day demand. We move forward in time to when Coburg will be fully built out. All that land within the urban boundary will have residential or non-residential population on it where, where it's allowed and where there's been plans for development and it's not constrained environmentally. We'll be looking at adding in the fullness of time about 18,000 people to the, to the distribution system, 18,000 users in residential demand. So that takes us to a total of 39,000 people from a residential population. We multiply that out by our, our average per capita demand, and we see our residential demand going from about 5,000, almost 6,000 to 11,000 cubic meters per day. Same type of approach with the, the non-residential users. 
we're looking at about 190 hectares of additional undeveloped residential or non-residential land. If that were all to develop and build out, we'd be servicing a total of 475 hectares, 476 hectares, at about 11 cubic meters per hectare per day, gives us 5,200 cubic meters in non-residential water demand. So that takes us to a future build out total of about 16,000 people or 16,000 cubic meters per day, sorry. And on an average day and a max day demand of about 27,500. So that's almost 79% growth to build out. So that's a fairly significant uptick in, in the demand that needs to be met. So that's really the purpose of the master plan is to crystal ball out into the future, look at that and say, what sort of facilities do we need to start planning for to meet those demands? So very quickly, population and demand summary. This is essentially just the last two slides in a, in a nutshell. Um, where we're at, we're providing about 15,300 cubic meters per day max day demand now. And moving forward, we need to be able to meet about 27,500, and that's almost an 80% increase in, in daily water demand. And at that final number, instead of a service population today, equivalent population of 32,000, we're at about 58,000 people. So where does that lead us in terms of needs for the system? So we'll start at the bottom end with water treatment and the water treatment plant and talk a little bit about that first. So the existing water treatment plant, which is located at the foot of Darcy Street, um, just north of the lake, south of Lakeshore Drive, was constructed originally in 1978. And then there's been major upgrades done to the pump house, which is where the high lift pumps are in 1987, and the low lift pumps as well that bring water in from the lake. And upgrades in 2002 to provide the chlorine contact tanks with help with which handle the disinfection of the, the treated water. So really quickly, without getting too detailed, but at a very high level, the raw water comes in from Lake Ontario, and just by gravity, it flows into the low lift pumping station well. There are then four low lift pumps that pump that water up into this facility here, the circular building that uh, a lot of people have probably seen fairly distinctive, uh, which is the clarifier. The clarifier helps to settle out solids and sediment that are in the water. It then moves through there from the clarifier into the filters. So then it moves into a uh, sand granular activated carbon filter media that takes out smaller fine materials in the water and, uh, and pops out essentially treated water that goes into the chlorine contact tanks where it's chlorinated and the chlorine has time to contact the water and disinfect and provide us with our treated water, which then moves into the reservoir and is pumped into the distribution system by the high lift pumps. So, where are we at? Where are we going? So as the capacity utilization at the plant increases, certain processes are taxed more heavily and we need to have greater uptime in those processes to ensure that in a day we can put out um, the right amount of water to meet demand. So some ongoing investments are required to maintain the condition and capacity of the water treatment plant. Overall, we look at a number that we call net delivery capacity. So the plant can treat has a rated capacity of about 36,000 cubic meters per day. Our net delivery capacity, what we can put out of the plant into the system is about 90% of that at around 32,700. Really what that reflects is some of the treated water actually has to be used in the plant to backwash filters and clean various pieces of the process equipment. So some of that has to be allocated there. And then we have the balance of the net delivery capacity that we can put out to the distribution system to meet demands. So today we're operating at about 47% of net delivery capacity of the, the Coburg Water Treatment Plant. And at build out, the Coburg Water Treatment Plant will be operating at around 84% of its net delivery capacity. So the good news there, or what, uh, what's good there is that the existing plant does not need to be expanded in its total capacity to meet those future demands. What is required, um, is that there's an investment made to ensure that it can reliably operate and deliver up to its full rated capacity. And we'll get into that a little bit as we go forward here. So in the short term, there's filter media, there's aging pipes and equipment that uh, has a, a, a life cycle and a shelf life that uh, wears out and needs to be replaced. So in a zero to four year time frame, we've identified through the master plan about $2 million worth of those sorts of projects. 
In a longer term time frame, five to 10 years, we've identified about $13.3 million in projects. A significant portion of that includes rehabilitation or replacement of the existing clarifier. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then beyond that, there will continue to be um, longer term items that will need to be replaced. And that's about, uh, about $2 million in the, the term just past the next 10 years. So there's, there's an investment that needs to be made in the plant. Most of that is related to the clarifier replacement. So right now, the way things operate today and the way the plant was designed and built 42 years ago uh, is such that it basically depends on that one clarifier. So there's two filter trains, but there's only one clarifier. So all the water that's treated by the plant has to flow through that one clarifier. So it can't be taken out of service without shutting the whole plant down for, and so that can't happen for extended periods of time. Only part of a day is about about the max. And as the demand increases on the plant, um, the need to, and flexibility to rehabilitate that clarifier will decline because the, we need more uptime from the plant and we have less opportunities for replacement because we need to find a way to replace it without taking it offline or, or compensating for its loss somehow. So I'm gonna move through these fairly quickly, but we have looked at six options some of which involve working with the existing clarifier, temporarily providing another means of, of treatment to augment it, take it out of service and basically rebuild or rehabilitate it as it is and return to the status quo. Um, we've also looked at just getting rid of it and permanently moving to another form of treatment, which would uh, involve adding UV disinfection to compensate for the loss of the clarifier. And then ultimately it could be removed um, let me go backwards here, sorry. We've also looked at adding a second similar clarifier just like the current one. So basically twinning it so that we could run both clarifiers and split flow between them and we would essentially have the capacity of the full plant in either one of them. Looked at adding a new clarifier system somewhere else on the site and looked at adding a new clarifier system within the existing clarifier building, so within that circular building. So of all those options, options C3, C5, and C6 are, are technically viable and can be done without too much difficulty through the analysis that we've completed. Um, and option C5 is the preferred option. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So option C5 involves building a new clarification facility on the site, not within the location of the existing clarifiers. So this can continue to run and operate until such time as the new clarifiers are online. So this reduces the risks of basically investing in a building that uh, for 40 plus years has been, is basically a tank full of water. Um, and there's no major investment in temporary measures to operate the plant without the clarifier because we have the clarifier for the whole time we're building the new ones, the existing one is in place. What this does is ultimately provides the flexibility in the future to for Lucy to have the choice of clarifier technology, whether that's solved air flotation or something else that it chooses to implement. The new system can impl be implemented in what we would call a series of trains. So basically you have individual modules that together total your rated capacity or slightly above, but you can always take one out of service while the others remain in service. So it's not like, it's not an all or nothing situation like the existing clarifier. And then ultimately it does provide the option to, once the existing clarifier is no longer needed, add a third filtration train in the long term, which then avoids the issue of uh, when the plant is operating near its capacity, there's an ability to cycle between three existing filtration trains at that time and, uh, and have the buffer to operate with the continuous uptime that's needed. So moving from treatment to pumping and storage and starting with treated water storage requirements. So today in the distribution system, we have about 10,000 cubic meters of existing storage. Um, about 5,000 of that is at the water treatment plant reservoir. About 1,300 is floating storage up in the zone one elevated tank or water tower. And another almost three times what's in zone one floating is in zone two floating in the Strathy Road elevated tank water tower. And if we take the kind of current design standards and current best practices and work that out into what is required for storage, about 12,500 cubic meters. So there is a small shortfall there um, under what would ideally be provided in the system. 
today. So there's a, a bit of a shortfall to meet. If we look at the future build out, we have that 10,000 cubic meters of storage that exists today. We have this shortfall, which is included in there. And then we have the additional storage requirements from future growth. So that puts us at about 18,000, almost 19,000 cubic meters of water storage that's required at build out. So how do we get there? The master plan's preferred strategy for that is to retain most of the existing storage. So the reservoir at the plant and the zone two elevated tank up on Strathy Road. And then we need to find a way to provide 10,000 cubic meters roughly of additional storage. The first piece of that puzzle that the master plan proposes is a new zone one elevated tank at 5,000 cubic meters. So this would offset the existing storage shortfall and also provide some capacity for growth in the system. As time moved on, the old zone one elevated tank would then be decommissioned, removed from service when it reaches an age that it can no longer be financially um, viably maintained and kept in service. And then quite far down the road, ultimately when more storage is required in zone two, two new at grade tanks would be built. So rather than a big tank on the top of a tall pedestal, those are would be at grade tanks that can be placed up on high ground and, and built right at the ground level. So the tank basically starts right at ground level and then goes, goes up from there. And last and, and maybe not uh, exactly in this form would be an additional 1,350 cubic meters of storage to round out the requirement. It's likely that by the time this time horizon is reached many, many years from now that there'll be future growth projections and that this new storage would be larger still to service future demand that's going to be identified through future iterations of master plans over the, the decades to come. So that gives us just over 19,000 cubic meters of storage and we have no storage in zone three, it's all in zone one and two and we pump everything to zone three because it's relatively small is the, the overall strategy. So then talking about pumping and how do we deal with pumping. Today, we can push about 750 liters per second out of the high lift pumps at the treatment plant into zone one. Currently in zone one, we need to meet maximum day demand of about 178 liters per second. And uh, this is where other things start to come in. We also need to plan because the Coburg system is designed for fire protection. You need to be able to supply water to hydrants and sprinkler systems and all that, uh, that sort of stuff. So we need to be able to supply about 378 liters per second of fire flow as well, which does somewhat dwarf the, uh, the actual demand. So we have 750, we need a total of 556 and uh, the system is capable of providing that today. Ultimately at build out zone one, we'll have a demand, max day demand of 320 liters per second. And that same fire flow will continue to prevail. And we need almost 700 liters per second. We're also able to meet that demand. So. The current high lift pumping station is well positioned to meet the zone one demands, which include all the max day demands that we need to pump up into zone two and zone three from zone one. So the high lift pumping station is, is in good shape as it is, doesn't need to be expanded. Zone two and three is a bit of a different story. So we have the Ewart Street booster pumping station is the only station that pumps into zone two. It can move about 152 liters per second, uh, what we call firm capacity. So it has three pumps that are all the same, but we always assume for, for safety and planning that one of those pumps is out of service, the largest pump and in the case of Ewart, they're all the same. So that leaves us with 152 liters per second. Our current pumping requirements, uh, based on the way the zone is operated, we need to pump 102 liters per second of peak hour demand, and then we can get all the fire flow needed from the Strathy Road tank. So we've got lots of water floating up there. We can meet those demands today and, and everything is good. In the future, we still have 152 liters per second, which leaves us with a short-term capacity to support growth in, uh, in zone two of about 19 liters per second of additional pumping capacity, which equates to about 2,200 people that, uh, that zone two can grow by before more pumping capacity is needed. So if we go to the future, the ultimate pumping capacity to feed zone two's max day demand is 159 liters a second. We also have to feed zone three through, through zone two, and we need to provide a slightly smaller fire flow in that area given the nature of development. So we need to be able to pump about 432 liters per second, uh, including, as I say, pumping up to, uh, up to zone three. 
So that ultimately at build out leaves a shortfall of about 280 liters per second. Um, we can't meet that 432. So how do we get there? What's the strategy? So the overall pumping strategy, the, the water treatment plant highlights continue to pump into zone one, everything is good. We have the existing York Street bump, pumping station pumping into zone two, 152 liters a second. In the relatively near future, a new zone two booster pumping station would be provided. Uh, the preferred strategy is to do that and pump about 120 liters per second into zone two from that new facility. So the other thing that this does is, is provide some redundancy so that if one booster station is offline or has, a, has an issue, then the other booster station can at least take over and, uh, and keep supplying some water to the elevated tank and then carry things along. And then in the longer term, to meet that full build out demand, the York Street booster pumping station uh, could be expanded by providing additional pumps at the existing site for 160 liters per second. So then we get our total of 432 and that is diversified amongst two pumping stations pumping into zone two. We then need to service new zone three and zone three would be serviced with its own booster pumping station, ultimately pumping 272 liters per second up to the top of the system in zone three. So looking at what the options are for zone one, storage and zone two pumping. Um, that's a fairly big part of the project. Where do we provide that new booster pumping station and where do we provide that new zone one floating storage at 5,000 cubic meters in a water tower? We've looked at a number of options. The idea is generally to locate those two facilities together on one site so they can take advantage of, of the same water main infrastructure and to locate them away from the existing facilities so that we're, we're creating redundancy in the system. So five options have been considered. The first of two options uh, on the existing Victoria Street site, and I'm just gonna back up here, sorry, Bear with me. So on the Victoria Street site, that could either be on the site of the existing tower or on an expansion of that site, which would require some property acquisition. Another option would be to the west of Darcy Street on the Legion Field soccer pitch. Option three would be on land that is future development land where Kerr Street would be extended at Brook Road that's currently privately owned. Option four would be behind Lucy's substation on Brook Road on lands that are part of the phase two of the Villages of Central Park development that would ultimately be dedicated as part of the parkland to the town. And option five is to the south and to the east of the Coburg Community Center in an area today that's currently gravel parking behind uh, some of the old, old military depot buildings that uh, remain on the east side of Darcy Street. So we've gone through and evaluated those various options and scored them out. Um, option 1A is, uh, is very challenging from a site availability perspective because it involves expanding that existing Victoria Street site that's very constrained. It also has some real technical challenges in terms of uh, it's not well connected to zone two for a pumping station. So it's very expensive and complicated to get redundant water mains up into zone two with sufficient capacity. So that option is not highly preferred. Even less preferred is putting it on the site of the existing tank because it suffers from all the same drawbacks as that other option of expanding that site, except for the existing tank would have to be out of service for almost a year and a half to build out that option. And then option two, which is over at the soccer fields on Darcy Street is a good option, but it displaces that existing community facility, which is not ideal. And it's located within the Brook Creek floodplain. So there would be a number of environmental and flood proofing issues that would have to be have to be dealt with. Option three is, is challenging because that land isn't currently owned by the municipality or by Lucy. It's not actively in the development process, so it's difficult to, uh, to bring facilities online on that land in the near term. Option four is, is an interesting option as well. It's not a bad option either. It, does, it is fairly far north, so it means there's quite a bit of water main that needs to be built to connect it to, to zone one and, and provide it with redundant connections. And it would be built on what would be future parkland dedicated to the town um, through the development process. So it's a little bit unideal that way. Option five is what has emerged as the preferred option. So that's to be to the south and the west of the CCC 
you know, on that current gravel parking lot. It's not perfect. It does have some technical challenges and it does involve a little bit of a rethink of some of the CCC campus master plan, but it's, it's the most viable of the, the five options which we've considered. So what does that look like specifically? So the Cobra Community Center being here, the uh, Legion Field Ball Diamonds being here, and the oh, pumping station and water tower would be co-located on a facility located just near where the gravel parking is and, uh, and occupy the space on the south side of Barracks Drive with existing soccer fields to the north and some of these existing buildings and then ultimately some parking. So what it would really entail is in the CCC master plan, which shows this parking, there would be a few things that would be need to be reconsidered and, uh, and retweaked in there. So that's option five. The land is owned by the town of Coburg. It has similar surrounding institutional type land uses on the adjacent site. It's not directly adjacent to any residential uses. Um, the existing zone one elevated tank can remain in service. So that's a significant advantage. We can build this tank and still have the other tank, which is, is important to how the system operates reliably. It's well positioned in terms of its proximity to future zone two trunk mains. And as compared to the site that we looked at a little bit further to the south, it's not impacted by the floodplain of Brook Creek. And the disadvantage is, as I've said, is that the town will have to reassess the Cobra Community Center master plan a little bit and juggle a few things around in there, have those discussions with, uh, with town staff. And uh, that uh, is something that generally appears that it can be accommodated. And the other disadvantage is we do need a little bit of extra zone one water main because we're creeping a bit far north. So we got to bring some water main up from zone one to, uh, to service this site. And that's this blue line here, which would have to run down to, to uh, we're on Darcy Street here down to uh, the extension of Kerr Street that was recently completed. So what does all this look like from a financial perspective of the pumping and storage project costs? So that new elevated tank is about $7.3 million project. A significant portion of that funded from the water rates and a smaller portion funded from development charges because of the capacity it provides for future growth and, and the idea that growth pays for growth through development charges that are paid by developers when they build either residential units or commercial space. Ultimately $1.6 million to decommission the existing zone one elevated tank um, at the end of its life. Another $1.6 million for the, for the booster pumping station that would be co-located with the, the new zone one elevated tank. That facility would be paid for entirely out of development charges because the only reason that additional pumping capacity is being provided is to satisfy the future demands of growth. So there's no impact to the existing rate base there. And then ultimately that future zone three booster pumping station at about $2 million, the first phase of it up to 100 liters per second, which again would be 100% development charge funded. So those are our storage projects, which are mainly funded from water rates because they deal with existing needs. And then the pumping projects that are mainly funded from development charges because they deal with growth. And then looking beyond the one to 10 year time horizon, what's required 10 years plus out to build out. So some of this could be very far in the future indeed. Um, for storage that would involve building some more zone two storage in the form of two at grade tanks, ultimately 100% development charge recoverable and those tanks would be located up in zone three and feed back down to zone two. And then some additional storage in zone one to build out that last piece of the capacity at about $3.1 million. And that might take the form of a larger project at the you know, kind of final time prize in the, 2050 or beyond as, as build out approaches. On the pumping side, ultimately expanding the zone three pumping station um, in a second phase, again, 100% development funded, and then expanding the Ewart Street booster pumping station, again, 100% development funded. So basically all of these longer term projects that don't deal with any existing needs are, are would be funded through development charges and, and growth paying for so last but not least, uh, I'll try to wrap up here as quick as we can and, and get through distribution system. So this is just looking at the, the length of water main in the distribution system by age. So you can see 
a lot of the Coburg water distribution system is newer, but there is a portion of the system that is 70 plus years old that is going to continue to need investment to repair and replace that water main so they can continue to operate reliably. Most of that water main is what's shown in the orange color, so it's cast iron. If we look at sort of when those water mains need to be replaced, typically based on their age and use that to kind of consider the funding requirements, that leads to about an annual funding investment of almost $3 million, $2.93 million per year in water main replacement over the next 10 years. Um, that deals with some backlog and then that drops off slightly over the 10 year period beyond that to an average of $2.8 million per year. Um, one of the things that we've looked at to target how that investment would be made is the available fire flow in the system. So most water mains are big enough to meet all of the, what we call domestic water demand. So people using water at home on an average day basis, what really drives the sizing of most water mains is being able to provide that really high flow during a fire and, uh, and supply fire trucks from the fire hydrants. So the system has been built obviously over many, many years going you know back as far as hundred years or more. Um, various standards of design have prevailed over those years. So using the modeling that we've developed for the master plan, we can look at what available fire flow is there and then help to target the investment of water main upgrade dollars to help address fire flow issues and improve fire flow. So some near-term target areas are shown here in red. And then some longer term target areas are shown in purple and this would you know largely be taking older areas of the town that haven't seen uh, water main replacement yet and bring some of that infrastructure up to standard or looping water mains to provide greater flow in those areas. Um, looking beyond that existing system into what's needed to support growth and development we've identified a series of projects that are largely around that northern and eastern part of the town that would, this will guide Lucy and the town in working with developers and determining what the requirements of the developers are as they build out the water distribution system as part of new subdivisions and commercial developments. So this water main provides, or this map provides an overview of where the trunk major water mains would be. Obviously most of that system expansion is in zone two where most of the growth is located and most of those projects would be 100% development funded. And there are a few zone one projects and other projects that are, are partially rate funded as well. So wrapping up, what does that look like in terms of projects getting implemented in the community over time? So to start with, um, that would be at first in the two to five year time horizon, that new zone one elevated tank, um, the preferred site being option five, south and east of the Coburg Community Center. At the same time, the co-located booster pumping station on that same site as the, the water tower elevated tank. Moving forward into the future as growth continues to happen and, and growth starts to extend into zone three, the zone three booster pumping station coming online probably in the five to 10 year time horizon. Further into the future, certainly well beyond 10 years, expanding the York Street pumping station then starting to provide at-grade tanks that provide more storage up in zone two. So the first of those continuing to expand and build out the zone three pumping station to its ultimate capacity. And then building the second tank in zone two that would provide storage for zone two. And ultimately as well, um, I missed the box here, but uh, eventually sometime in the five to 10 year horizon decommissioning that existing Victoria Street elevator. So what does the future distribution system look like in a schematic similar to the way we, we sort of looked at when we started? So we still have the water treatment plant basically unchanged, although we have a new clarification system there. Zone one will have grown, but not by a whole lot. It'll be about 16,000 people, almost 12,000 cubic meters of demand. Still have the zone one distribution system, a new zone one elevated tank, the existing Victoria Street tank decommissioned ultimately. Zone two will have grown significantly to about 20,000 people and 13,000 cubic meters of demand. So it now represents the, the larger share of demand. We have an expanded York Street Booster pumping station ultimately pumping into the zone two distribution system. 
still servicing the Strathy Road elevated tank, providing storage. Ultimately, these two new at grade tanks up at higher elevation. And in the near term, we would augment the existing York Street booster pumping station with the new Zone 2 booster pumping station. And ultimately, Zone 3 comes online. It's the smallest of the three zones, about 2,500 people. And it would be supplied from oops, a Zone 3 booster pumping station in continuous operation with no storage in Zone 3. So what does that look like in terms of dollars in the next 10 years, including that annual water main replacement program, the water main expansion projects? There's about $84 million worth of, of water main pumping, storage, and treatment work to be done in Coburg. Um, a little over half of that would be paid for through rates, and that's largely these pumping projects and the, uh, I'm sorry, the storage project and the, the clarifier upgrades at the treatment plant. And then the balance of the works, a lot of the water main expansion is funded through development charges and growth paying for growth. Moving beyond that, beyond the next 10 years, there's a, there's a, you know, we're not showing continued investment there in the, the distribution system, but for a little bit of clarity of what the big projects look like, um, there's about $20 million worth of work beyond the annual program costs. And most of that is funded for and paid for by growth. And that's largely pumping expansion projects and water main expansion projects that would occur to help service the Coburg East community. So what are the next steps and where have we been? So we kicked the project off a while ago. There's been a ton of technical review leading to everything we've talked about tonight. And that brings us to the stakeholder consultation we've done with the town and then to where we are here today, sharing this with the community and, and providing people with an opportunity to provide their feedback on this plan. So we're sitting here at that dot master plan would continue to be developed and then shared with Coburg Council and then ultimately we get to the final master plan document after that and then moving forward as Lucy and the town and partnership move forward to implement various projects some of them as I said will require municipal class environmental assessments that's a process through which public works um, municipal infrastructure projects of a significant nature are planned um, and that that process has different schedules. So a Schedule C is a very complicated project, a Schedule A is a very simple project, and a Schedule B project is somewhere in the middle, and that's where most of the, the big projects that we've talked about tonight land. So the main Schedule B projects that would have further municipal class EA planning that would build on the master plan work are the new Zone 2 booster pumping station, the new Zone 1 elevated tank, the new zone three booster pumping station and then um, the new zone two at grade tanks and some of the major linear water main projects that aren't in a road allowance somewhere. So in summary, there's, there's very significant population growth forecast for the Coburg community and that really leads to water demand growth of about 79% to build out. There is a small existing storage deficit and increased demands require new storage facilities in zone one in the near term and ultimately in zone two. Our existing pumping capacity can support about 2,200 more people in zone two before that needs to be expanded. And the water treatment plan has sufficient capacity to support growth and build out, but does require investments to help sustain that capacity. And last but not least, the renewal and expansion of the distribution system does represent a significant cost that is funded through a mix of both rates water rates and, uh, and development charges. So wrapping up here, that's, uh, that's it from me in terms of the, the formal presentation. Uh, just pause briefly to thank everybody for their, their time and interest tonight. And uh, we, we really appreciate everybody listening and joining us. So how to provide some feedback and stay engaged. Um, certainly at this point, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll get to you for a question. We can have some discussion. I see a few questions have been submitted as we, we go along here, so we'll, we'll tend to those. And then ultimately, we'd encourage everybody to visit engagecoburg.ca um, slash water master plan, or just go to engagecoburg.ca and click on the link on the main page. Um, and that'll take you to the project page uh, where you can get, uh, get additional details. So this presentation, the recording of this presentation will be there. The draft master plan summary report will be there available tomorrow. and 
there will also be a post presentation survey that uh, that you can complete and we'd ask that if you, you're interested in doing that if we'd like to get your feedback by, by June the 9th and uh, you can also stay informed about the next steps there so with that thank you very much for, for your time and thanks for listening and uh, I'll turn it back to the Lucy staff and we'll uh, we'll deal with some uh, some questions Perfect. Uh, thank you, Dan. So the first question that we have received through um, the question and answer is from Paul, and he's asking, does your model include, does your model include for water losses due to leakage of deteriorating infrastructure? So um, the short answer is yes, the little bit longer answer is when we look at these water demands on the system, we're generally looking at what is pumped out of the plant into the system or what's pumped through one of the pumping stations. So that water includes everything that's used by somebody um, and goes through their water meter and they pay a bill for it, as well as all the water that's lost due to leakage. So yes, in that per capita factor, there is included a lost water factor there that, uh, that accounts for for that leakage and, uh, and loss. And as the system gets improved and, and built over time, typically that number starts to decline. And uh, it, historically it has probably been higher, but yeah, that's considered in the numbers. And Paul, I've unmuted your microphone if you have any follow-up questions for Dan. No, he's answered my questions. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. Thanks for that, Paul. Uh, the Second question is from Grant. Will there be a bulk water fill station in the near future? Um, I might turn this over to Lucy staff to, uh, to answer that one, if that's okay. Uh, I don't know whether Derek or Larry, either of you'd like to speak to that. Yes, Certainly. Um, with respect to um, bulk water fill, water fill station um, grant. We used to have a uh, bulk water uh, fill station at the current um, uh, water treatment plant. What we identified is it created this, a bunch of uh, liability in terms of uh, the trucks and diesel and gas leaks, et cetera. And so we decommissioned that. Um, so at this point in time, uh, there is no plan to, uh, to actually install another uh, fill station. It's something that we will uh, continue to uh, analyze and discuss though in the future. Does that answer your question? Oh, Grant, did you have any follow-up questions or was that answer sufficient? Look on my list, Grant might be muted. Alexis, I don't know if you're able to unmute him. Oh, I've asked for him to unmute, so he just might not be getting that prompt. We'll wait, and he can uh, he can raise his hand again if he has a follow up question. Um. Yeah, I think if there, if there are any other questions anybody would like to ask, if you hit the hit the raise your hand button, uh, Alexis can uh, can unmute you and uh, and. Uh, let us know what your questions might be. Okay. No, we're not seeing any more questions at this time. Um, there, oh, Grant says all good, thank you. Thank you, Grant. Um, so if that is the case and we don't have any more questions, um, then we're at the conclusion of our presentation. We'd like to remind all attendees to please visit engagecoburg.ca and complete our quick nine question survey that will be um, posted live tomorrow. It closes on June 9th and it's just um, uh, asking for additional feedback about the proposed recommendations for the master plan. There's also a spot on the on engagecoburg.ca where you can ask public questions for us to respond to. 
Um, but in addition to that, if you want to reach anybody that's here today, please send an email to lucy, lusi at lusi.on.ca. So lucy at lucy.on.ca. And we'll make sure that, um, that we can address any questions that you might have. So if I don't see any more questions, I guess that brings us to the conclusion. So thank you to all of our attendees for participating this evening and enjoy the rest of your night. Jen, thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation as well. And uh, the staff at uh, SEMA Plus, as well as uh, Lucy's staff, thank you everyone and have a great evening. Thank you very much for that, Derek. It's our pleasure. Have a great evening all. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.